So hi everyone, thanks for coming tonight. Um, we are super excited for this event that we have. Um, we have Liz Allred and Shaba Shams who will be speaking to us tonight about their international um, business experience. And we have Hadjar who will be interviewing them and we are super excited for this and I will let Hadjar take over with the interview. Hello, wonderful people. Welcome to our panel, an interview with women in international business. I am Hajar Ben Saha, and on behalf of the International Business Club and Women in Business Association, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. I will be the, the questions lady today, and I will start with Ms. Shams. In about 10 minutes, tell us about your background. Well, I always start with my uh, tagline, which is hello, citizens of the world, because I do talk to people all over the world. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, an honor to be part of this conversation and share my humble experience with you ladies. And I hope you can take some good, uh, good thoughts and good ideas from this. Um, so in a nutshell about me or background, however you want to call it, um, it's really hard to summarize 50 plus years in 10 minutes. So um, I'm originally from Algeria. I was um, born and raised in Algeria. So I'm an Algerian born entrepreneur and I moved to the United States about 20 plus years ago. Uh, I landed in O'Hare International Airport with no English um, and big dreams. So um, I had to break through a, a lot of obstacles and challenges to understand what this new culture and this world was about. And I believe that I really managed in understanding the rule number one is really learn English and become proficient at it, which I did. I um, have spent my entire adult life actually in academia. That's why I was very honored and very excited to come to speak to you guys because it's like, oh my goodness, the mothership, you know, going back to my roots. I spent um, about 20 years in academia. I attended the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I attended Syracuse University, uh, completed three master's degrees. And of course I've been in you know, college professor, university professor. And then I moved into uh, management and leadership and librarianship. And then after um, all of those experiences, I moved about three years ago, I moved to Florida, sunshine, my dream state actually, cause I love the sun and I'm from the Mediterranean. Um, when I arrived to uh, Florida, I was like, okay, this is home, now what? And that's when I decided to really take all my experiences from the, the, the librarianship world and the leadership world and the educational world and move into entrepreneurship because I believe that all those pieces of the puzzle create the big picture of what I want to accomplish in my life as a businesswoman and entrepreneur. Well, thank you for this amazing uh, introduction and background about yourself. Let's move on to the first question. Okay. So how does your background help you in your business career? And what unique contributions have you made to business because of your international background and perspective? So first of all, when we talk about background, I really wanna be very clear here that it's not just about the traditional educational background, although that helps. Uh, you gain a level of expertise, knowledge from the traditional classroom, but as an immigrant minority woman, you know, coming, like I said, to the state with few pennies in my pocket and two suitcases and, you know, no family, no friends and no relatives. And you like completely out of your space, your landscape, you have to learn. And that constitute actually my biggest background. Um, it taught me how to be resilient, how to um, adapt and integrate. And all of those experiences, either in the traditional classroom or my own personal experience taught me how to fast, you know, think fast and solve problems fast. Um, which actually I am applying in my own business. When COVID-19 hit, uh, my business had to completely redefine itself from being a consulting, you know, kind of a traditional consulting company going to training staff and leaders to, ouch, now what, right? And, um, you know, we all moved into this virtual platform, which actually, um, it, it's kind of so interesting that sometimes 
things happen for really a reason where you can find your calling and your voice even better. Um, I have always felt like I was a citizen of the world. I've always wanted to reach uh, communities at this global citizenship and international level. And COVID-19 facilitated that. When I had to move my business from going knocking on doors to literally sitting behind my computer, uh, that's really when I believe that I am reaching my fullest potential because here I am creating, I'm hosting a, a show uh, where Shabba Shams, uh, sorry, Shabba Speaks, talk about health, wealth, and relationships. My guests are all over the world. You know, they, I speak to somebody on, from Pakistan one moment and then from Canada another moment and Dubai another time. So this is really where my heart is. Uh, my company now and my business is evolving at this international amazing way that really when I grab the, the mic and even live or record it and I say, hello, citizens of the world, I feel it in my heart when my audience is commenting. It's like, hello from Bangladesh and hello from here and hello from there. And this is really what my calling is about is to connect, inspire and empower people all over the world. And of course, um, I am also very much about women, women, young adults, um, for instance, creating, we just started a new initiative, creating a safe um, uh, on social media, a safe environment for women to, you know, to create the ability to earn money or influence on impact online using social media. That's a whole nother story there um, for women and how we can do that. So yeah, I, I believe that my background being, you know, from North Africa, Muslim, women, Berber, minority, immigrant, all of those pieces go into this program and that program and this hardship and this experience, all these amazing bits of pieces um, makes you who you are. So you have to embrace them all and make them work to create what is the final masterpiece of your puzzle of who you are, your legacy and what you're put on this planet to do. So um, I hope I did answer the question. As far as um, what have you contributed to the, with the business of this international level? This, um, this initiative uh, that we're talking actually with some international lawyers and attorneys and social media uh, marketers and digital marketers as well. And young adults, I have some young uh, people, influencers at the age of 13 and 14 and 12. They're just amazing and incredible. We're bringing all these, these forces, this energy together and we're trying to start an initiative where we influence policy making regarding how social media is used by men, by everybody, but more specifically by young adults and women to keep them safe. Um, you know, cybersecurity is one aspect, bullying is one aspect, harassment in another one. So that's one aspect. Um, another one about a few months ago, I launched a challenge online where I was helping uh, Pakistanis communities and North Africans on how to start a business online. So that was an amazing experience. We did a seven day challenge. Um, all my shows, my podcasts are pretty much about business, international business, teaching uh, people digital literacy and how they can really uh, thrive instead of survive during COVID-19 and the difficult times that we're facing. And by the way, as optimistic as you can be, this whole thing is not over yet and we're gonna go through more of this time that we are using resources to empower and inspire and connect people online. So that's not gonna be done anytime soon. True, I like uh, how you talked about immigration and true like immigration and traveling gives people like new lenses to see the world and connect to others. Absolutely. However, the technology today in you know, order are giving us a new chance to connect and communicate and making the globe as a smaller city. Absolutely. And moving to the next question, mm -hmm. did you find it challenging to adapt with a new culture? And how did you adapt? Oh, goodness gracious. Um, well, I am one of those blessed uh, beings on this planet because I grew up already with four or five cultures. You know, as a child, I spoke for three languages. English is my fourth. And I grew up with uh, the heterogeneous part side of North Africa, a little bit of Berber, a little bit Amazigh, that's, a, that's my ethnic group, a little bit of Arabism, a little bit of fr French culture and Francophony. Um, and then all the other bits and pieces, you know, Algeria is just kind of a landfill of so many civilizations. 
And I, I grew up uh, wandering in the street of Algiers, especially that I started doing photography at the age of 14. So it gave me a really different perspective where I would grab my camera, kind of go discover, wander in the streets and discover the world. I think it really taught me from that photo, even though at the time I didn't know what it was, that I had this artsy eye where really I, 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 just, I just fell in love with life at early, early age. And I try to pull out anything that, that needs to be memorable and captured for, forever. And that's how I feel about my different cultures and my identity. And I know that especially uh, countries that had undergone uh, colonization, they, after post-colonization, they suffer from the crisis of identity because they don't know exactly who they are. They, they're the colonized, but then there are all these other pieces. I uh, have, I am grateful uh, because sometimes you do things and you don't think it's because you're smart, but because life guides you that way. I, I, I've been blessed that I looked at all these different pieces that are outside of me. And I told myself maybe at the age of nine years old, how in the world am I going to make this work? How am I going to make this work? I cannot deny this aspect for the other one. So instead of rejecting and creating conflict in me, I just embraced all these cultures. So when I came to America about 30 plus years ago, no, 23 years ago, sorry, I was more thinking about how old I was. Now you can do the math of how old I am. Actually, I'm turning 53 on Saturday, Halloween, October 31st. So when I came to the United States, for me, it's like, ah, it's just another piece that I need to add. So I, I, I embraced the, the culture. It was, a, you know, some culture shock. Um, you know, I didn't know what a potluck was when I was invited to one. So I showed my face without any food. And um, everybody was like looking at me weird. And it's like, I don't know what a potluck is. So then comes the next time I take food with me for a potluck. And then I was shocked when people were actually taking the leftovers because in my culture, we don't do that. So that's another cultural thing that I had to learn. Um, and of course, I, I, I manage really in um, working hard. And I think this is a call for people who don't understand other cultures that don't expect other people to come to you to teach you about who they are. You need to make that effort. And the reason I'm saying this is because as a Muslim woman, as a Muslim, I go to a lot of interfaith events and I always hear the question that is asked by non-Muslims and that is, what can you do as Muslims to teach us about your religion? And I'm like, uh, when the student is ready, the teacher shows up. If you wanna learn about Islam, if you wanna learn about Judaism, if you wanna learn about anything in life, even how to fix your TV or garden your tomatoes and you go to YouTube and you try to educate yourself. So don't wait, don't wait for people. Don't make it other people's responsibility to come and bring you knowledge expertise um it's your job you know we're all we all have a brain you know use it wisely use it in a way that it help you illuminate yourself inside out and learn about other people and i do that all the time i was in algeria when i actually took a course on comparative religions because i was fascinated by all that i didn't wait for people to come tell me what christianity and judaism and even atheism is about and i went through all these phases of discovery so I encourage people that if you want to learn about something about Islam or about uh, how to start a business or how to become an entrepreneur or how to learn a language or how to lose weight, whatever, whatever it is, commit and take responsibility. Now we become, we're becoming more of a passive learners, you know, almost like we, we feel like learning is like Netflix. We sit on a couch and on the remote and we, we hope that information is going to come to us like that. Uh, miracle of life. I wish. Uh, but so talking about cultures i think um as i'm looking at the world and what it's turned out to the fear that 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 is existing and panic mode and all that it's just ignorance a lot of it is ignorance and it is our responsibility to knock on the right doors and say hey um you're my neighbor you're jewish can you tell me about your faith hey you're a business entrepreneur you do this and that can you help me learn what i you know know what you don't know and i've been in the business actually of information literacy, digital literacy, and then teaching people, they don't know what they don't know. So seek knowledge that way. Don't make it other people's responsibility to learn. So that's my application of adapting to different cultures.
Thank you so much and happy early birthday though. Thank you. <laughs> I might have a virtual birthday party. I don't, let's, I don't know. <laughs> let's celebrate it then. And um, I really like your comments about like people go and search for the information to answer the questions in their head instead of waiting for an easy answers and just don't believe everything on the media or on the press. You need to go and like test this answers, right? Excellent. And going to the next question, what are the biggest challenges you face when working internationally? <laughs> you know, actually, <laughs> I ask you, <laughs> I ask you to add this question because I, I, I work with people all over the world. And to be honest with you, my biggest challenge is the time zone, man. I mean, it's like, oh my God. Uh, so I started off with just listing, like I have shows and meetings and, and panels and whatnot, conversations and discussions and Zoom calls and, and webinars and so on. And so at the beginning it was like, oh, is it Eastern or Central? Okay. Okay, we live in America. And then a little bit by little bit, it was like, oh, is it Eastern time, Florida, and then Pakistan? And then now it's like, is it Eastern time, Pakistan, Dubai, Algeria, Canada? And, and today you added Utah. <laughs> it's kind of interesting because Utah is actually in the United States. And it felt to me like, oh, did you say 6 p.m.? And she's like, yeah, 6 p.m. in my time. And I'm like, we're in the same country. I mean, not even thinking that it could be on different time zones. So time zone is actually uh, a big issue, not issue, I would say a big challenge because you just have a certain window of opportunity to work with people and combine them. And my, I might actually, I'm, I met a lady not long ago from Australia and she wanted to bring like panelists to speak about some topics. And I'm like, I ain't doing another 19 hours difference. You know, I'm like, maybe I'll save you for later. I'm not ready yet for you. So, um, Time zone is, is a, a big challenge for what I do. The second one is a language. Um, I am from North Africa. Clearly I communicate mostly in English. However, with my, my community, my audience, when I do events and teaching and whatnot, everybody's requesting, can you please speak Algerian? Can you please speak Middle Eastern? Can you please speak, you know, like modern standard Arabic or French or whatever? So I find it very uh, challenging to determine what languages should I be using. And more recently, somebody asked me to speak Amazir and I said, absolutely not. Um, you know, it's my mother tongue, but I'll save it for my mother because it's just so difficult to even, I don't even believe that I have the solid Amazir language in me, uh, even though I grew up speaking it, um, to be able to teach in, in, in the language. So. And then of course, methods of payment. So, you know, different countries have different resources and abilities. Uh, so when we do stuff like that, it's a challenge. So I would say these are the three challenges that I find working at international level and having clients and audiences uh, from different parts of the world. So oh, I truly understand the language challenges and even the time zone, that's a big issue as I try to talk to my family every day and they are seven hours ahead in Algeria. And yeah. that's another challenge. Like my little brother can't believe that I still in the morning when he is in night. And he said, how come? I was like, sorry, go and study some geography to understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I start getting messages at 9 p.m. Starting 9 p.m. Like, good mornings and how are you and all that. Because my uh, Pakistani friends, actually, it's morning for them. And it's like, uh, did I'm getting ready to go sleep. So maybe I'll talk to you tomorrow. So something like that. But I think it's wonderful that you, you like I said, for someone who uh, has this global citizenship approach, I, I just love it. I think it's a challenge, but it's something that I see more of uh, an opportunity and a blessing than anything else. That's true. So with your enabling exceptional growth through social media, you encourage woman to influence, impact, connect, educate, and create emotional, spiritual, intellectual, and financial stability and freedom. What advice do you, do you have to help us as women to accomplish these goals? Um, I was hoping the, <laughs> the answer would be short, but it's not. Uh, as, as women, I believe in women empowerment and women empowerment uh, starts with some 
you know, the way I see it, you analyze the ground and then you build the foundation. And then after you are sure that the foundation is strong enough, you start building your walls and your windows and your doors and your second and third floor. And the foundation to me, the assessment of the ground is really looking inward, looking into our core values. And I did actually uh, a webinar not long ago with the uh, e-commerce virtual summit where I was talking about the success framework, you know, what would it take for people to be successful? And a lot of entrepreneurs and business um, owners, they jump into a business and they're like, yeah, I'm going to do this and do that. And they start thinking about the doing, you know, and they're so worried about the whatever, if it's an online platform or the product or the service. And they, they're thinking about all that. And then any difficulty that comes their way, they don't have what Tony Robbins called the emotional fitness. And they're down and, you know, they either give up or the startup is going downhill and that's that. Um, so I always encourage, um, you know, people that I coach and my clients and so on that take time to really build that foundation, build your emotional fitness, your spiritual intelligence. Spirituality is very important. Um, emotional intelligence is very important. And you cannot just jump into a journey without having those tools. And, um, you know, even in some organizations now in the last five years, they are actually talking about spiritual intelligence because it really taps into the person higher level of core values and belief system, which actually is the, I don't know how to say the reinforcement of everything in life because an entrepreneur and a business owner will always have difficulties, challenges in life. What do they do in the darkest moment? People who don't have that emotional fitness, that emotion, that spiritual intelligence, that the core value is not that there. They don't know why they're doing what they're doing. The why is so important. Every day we wake up in the morning, we absolutely have to know why we're doing what we're doing. Because you know what? When, when it's difficult times, the why, you keep, like you say, you keep your eye on the, on the goal, on the target that, no, I'm doing this because he is my why. And then what is it? What is it that you believe you're put on this planet to do? What is your contribution to the world? And once you answer these questions, which is at the core foundation of, of you as a human being, an entrepreneur, then you start adding things. And I'm just going to quickly in the search of the why and the what, um, there is actually a hadith from our prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who says, Every individual on this planet is eased into accomplishing whatever uh, God, Allah, you, the higher power, the universe, whatever you want to call it, uh, had put him on this planet. So tapping into that spirituality, that emotional strength, knowing your why and your what is absolutely at the foundation of you as a human being and what you can accomplish. Because trust me, everything else comes and goes. The type of business you can do, uh, flexible, the product you sell, the services you, 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 you provide, anything that you do is, as an entrepreneur is meant to solve a problem, to solve a problem. So the people change, the needs of the society change, and therefore the product or the service could change. But what should be the foundation of all these other stuff is the why and the what, and what is it that you're put on this planet to do? So my advice to entrepreneurs in general, but more specifically in, to women, have a voice, know your why, know your what, and just be a badass and, and get it done. <laughs> I like when you mentioned uh, all of this advice, and you remind me of Stephen Covey uh, in his uh, Seven Habits Journey book, the book. Yeah. Seven ha yeah, Journey of Most Effective People. He mentioned how we need in the seven habits to take care of our spirit, heart, mind, and body. Absolutely. And you mentioned that as well. So I hope people are taking some notes out there. And the next question, where do you see women in business today? Well, I, I believe that women uh, have fought hard and worked hard. And they are, in, you know, in every aspect of business that we can imagine them they're they're out there and very successful and accomplished. Uh, but I believe that a lot more is to be done because when we talk about women, we should not think um, in a very uh, self-centered way that 
oh, we mean women in America, they're doing well. Uh, women in America or Australia or Europe, you know. So we have this sense that women in part of the countries have different opportunities. And this is something that we really need to address and talk about. Um, if we are blessed in this country to have access to good education, fast internet, having an awesome studio at home where you can talk to people all over the world. And yeah, although I feel really blessed and fortunate, but I believe that we have to put means in a way that women all over the country and also young adults all over the world uh, and women all over the world should have access to education, to internet, uh, to being able to connect because how else would they make money? How else would they educate? How else would they influence? Uh, so from a fairness standpoint or an equal approach standpoint, we need to provide for uh, women, women <laughs> globally, and young adults globally, um, access to tools, because these are just tools, the tools and the resources, and um, spend a significant amount of time educating. Um, I think we're a little bit behind on that. Today, um, I had a very amazing uh, guest in my show. His name is uh, Hassan Shibli, and he's the director of uh, Care Florida. And they actually fight for you know, justice, the human rights in the United States for Muslims and non-Muslims. And it's really impressive to see how people born in certain categories, I would say without and being too political have more advantages than others. And we need to change that. And our voices need to be clear and loud that we need to um, adopt, create opportunities and initiatives that really include women and young adults all over. And this is why this whole idea of the initiative on social media, the reason I'm doing it, and I, and I, I would like to share this for a moment because it really broke my heart when, um, when I had a conversation with a young entrepreneur, she's 12 years old, she's an influencer, a public uh, figure. And she was kind of sharing with me stories, I mean, outrageous stories about how people talk to her and treat her online. Um, and that's part of why I felt strongly about uh, starting this initiative to be able as the older generation, the pioneers of women online in a way, to really fight for women, especially the younger women, to come out and be able to feel safe online and do the work they need to do to educate and empower and educate and and, and run a business and monetize, but these opportunities cannot be provided to them um, if they don't have access, have access to the resources and the safety and, you know, I mean, online bullying is very intimidating. Can you imagine a 12 year old receiving nasty menace messages from older men without any reason for it? Or So that, that, that's really what led me into starting this initiative that I really hope will have um, a good echo in terms of policy making and protecting women and young adults when they are using online to educate themselves and grow. So thank you for sharing that as well. And true, we are so blessed to be in a developed country as the United States, where women can build their lives and careers as they want, hopefully. Like, like you said, like not all women around the world have the same opportunity as we are having here. So thank God. And in your perspective, how can we encourage women, more women involvement in the business world? Um, well, again, just opportunities, just try to be the agent of change that you want to see. And by that, I mean, connect, connect people. A lot of, a lot of us, and I'm just talking in a very broad way, um, they don't think about the importance of connecting people. And sometimes all you need is to bring A and B together and let them make magic. In fact, my mentor, or at least one of my mentors, he's from Pakistan, he taught me something. He said, I always like to connect people and put uh, like-minded people in the same room. Of course, room, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a metaphorical room or a virtual room because you know we're all over the world. Uh, because when two, three, four people who have the same thoughts or the same idea come together, 
magic, incredible things can happen. So us as educators, us having access to this international community, us having access um, to the internet, uh, social media. So instead of browsing through my Facebook all the time just to see who has had the best uh, outfit or, or food or whatever, honestly, what I do is I use my social media, probably one of the biggest consumer of social media, but I actually go to discover people and I find X, Y, and Z and I'm like, huh, these people can actually work together and connect. These people can have some, some insight. These people are great speakers about the topic. And this is where I'm trying to pull and extract expertise, knowledge, gifts out there. And I even started an internship program and I just invited you today to join where um, I did it actually about six months ago at the beginning of COVID where I take you know, uh, young adults or, you know, young adults, young adults <laughs> uh, from, from different parts of the world. And I do an internship program. And so we meet and we talk and we, you know, kind of read same material and have conversations about it. And that allows people to learn from one another in the group. And then also you can guide them into different projects or businesses they can, they can open up. And I really call on older generation like ourselves who've been in academia or teaching or managing or whatever, that we have this kind of net worth. We have a net worth, right? We have a net worth of a network, a net worth of a network that we can actually connect students and, 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 and people all over. And what happens is that we can facilitate this knowledge creation or this expertise extraction a lot faster. Because when you are in a classroom, for instance, or in your sitting, and you have 50, 100 people in front of you and like almost like every single person has a little data on them. And you take, for instance, this coordinates and then these coordinates and you put them together and let the conversation happen. And we have the obligation, like we were saying earlier, being blessed the way we are, we truly have the obligation of being these um, facilitators, these um, ambassadors in a way, these connectors among younger younger generations and um, share with them our expertise in a way, but then learn from them. And that will narrow the gap or generational communication, which is a must now. Um, so different things really we can, we can be doing. True, that really falls under the wise management of time and of our usage of social media, right? And there is that, that fact, that saying, if there is anything free on the internet work, that means you are the product. And let's move on to our uh, um, people or uh, our uh, people who are watching us on YouTube. There is a question for you is telling you, what advice do you have for someone who is looking at creating a retail e-commerce? Um, I do have a really good course of uh, e-commerce that I can share with you if you're interested. I studied e-commerce and I started actually investing a little bit in e-commerce. Um, and what was the question again? What? So what advice do you have for someone who is looking at creating a retail e-commerce? So uh, my experience with e-commerce, uh, because I jumped in it and then off of it for now, um, I'm very passionate about e-commerce and I believe that it's the future and actually e-commerce is um, one type of businesses that wasn't really affected by COVID-19. In fact, it, it went higher. So if really people are interested in e-commerce, go for it. It's a great pathway for um, income generation, generating. However, my advice to you is that before you jump into e-commerce, you have to have a good chunk of money that you are willing to gamble in the front. Because e-commerce means that you're finding products that you're going to be advertising for Facebook ads, Google ads, YouTube ads. And what happens is that there is really a tricky formula that you need to be aware of that before you start making money, you will start losing some. So now if you put a little bit up front and then you grow, that's probably the best way to go. But sometimes... Uh, People in e-com world, they're like, oh, you know, just, you know, the more you, you lose, then you're going to make it. If you have the heart to lose maybe three, four, five thousand, six thousand dollars in the front before you start making any penny, then e-commerce is for you. But it's not for everybody. It's like e-trade. 
a lot of people, they invest money and then they see it lost in the beginning and then they pull out. So if you want to really be successful in e-commerce, just have like an iron heart at the beginning. When you lose some of your money in the front, don't panic. You will make it later, but you really have to, to do uh, market research and audience research and product research. And my other advice, because I have seen people, for instance, in Europe, try to sell in America and they didn't know well the American audience and the product they picked. They were not good for American population. So make sure you know your audience. You do audience research through YouTube or, um, uh, gosh, those applications. I cannot think of them. But there are tons of applications out there that can help you understand your market. Uh, always, always, as an entrepreneur, think of your client, your avatar, your customer. Don't fall in love with the product. Don't fall in love with the service. It's about the people you serve. So listen to them and understand their needs, which can change and change with the audience. It sounds like I'm taking a marketing class here. Thank you for your, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your advice. And let's move for the last question. Then I will move to talk to Ms. Liz Alred. And this question is saying that, what would you tell your younger self knowing what you know now? Um, my fellow academician, faculty members, I apologize in advance because you're not going to like my answer. Um, I come from a, a family where I'm the first who finished my baccalaureate high school, went to college. I am the first educated woman. You know, my mother, grandmother are not educated, illiterate women. They are the product of the war, but brave, brave, inspirational women. Um, so I felt like I was under the pressure to get an education. And I always believed that the education is my salvation. And which is, which is the case because a lot of women, my generation who didn't have access to education got married at early age and they never did much with their lives. I hope they're happy because that's what matters. But um, I know some that aren't and that's really sad because it's the society and the family that imposed on them that path. So I followed the path of education and you know, after three master's degrees and nearly finished a doctorate and uh, tons of uh, dollars went into student loan and whatnot. I do realize that if I had to do it today, I would not go for that hardcore higher ed education because I mean, being an entrepreneur, it's solving problems, being a business owner, it's solving problems. And um, if you have a good mind and you understand the people, their problems and you connect with them, you can definitely um, start, you know, start a business at a very early age, especially now that I am in this world I see like millionaires at the age of 23 and it's like, oh my God, I could have saved myself like 30 years sitting in a classroom. Um, I, so I, I, I think what I'm trying to say here is that I was a big advocate of traditional education and I made my kids actually all go for, you know, getting college degrees and whatnot. In hindsight today, um, I believe that there is more to life than just traditional education. And that people, if they have the drive and they want to accomplish their themselves and they know what they want to solve and what they want to do and the impact they want to have in the world, um, then I, I, I believe they don't have to go through traditional education and they can do self-education. Um, and there are so many different means and ways for people to uh, reach their fullest potential and live their you know their their dream life so don't don't lock your mind in a box in a way and i think that the more experience you have and you know you you do different things that your perspective change and i'm so grateful that my perspective changed so now when i have my younger me come to me and like oh i want to do photography or i want to do this uh, show write this book i'm not going to tell them hey go to college to learn how to do it it is like okay write a plan and execute it right now. You can start tonight, so don't waste your time. So I think that's what it is. You, you can find different ways of solving problems um, besides the traditional way of go to college until a certain age and then get a job and work eight to five. And it's not for everybody. And that which we should understand that it's not for everybody. So people need to find their calling. 
like think out of the box and get out of your comfort zone. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ms. Shaba. Thank, Thank you for you your welcome. amazing talk and be with us, please. Of course. And uh, now snap, I will snap, give- fingers. Can I get a snap, snap fingers? Right? <laughs> there you go. Now Thank I will, now I, get, I will give the mic to Ms. Liz Arred. Hello, Ms. Arred, how are you today? I'm well, how are you doing? I'm doing amazing and I'm surviving the day. Good. <laughs> In about 10 minutes, tell us about your background, please. Um, well, I'll take less than 10, but um, so I spent most of my growing up years um, outside of the United States and came as a young teenager to, um, to the United States. And so um, it took me um, quite a long time to feel like I was an American to have enough um, reference points to share with people, with my peers. It was a bit challenging and sometimes interesting um, in that regard. Uh, some embarrassing moments here and there. Um, and um, so, so that was very interesting for me coming um, to the United States and have, having to figure out this culture, which although technically I was an American, um, it wasn't my culture. So the, the, the nice thing about this I have found though, is, is that whenever I go someplace else, I feel immediately comfortable. Even if I don't speak the language, even if the people don't look like me or I don't look like them, I just feel like once I leave the United States and I arrive someplace, I feel like I know what to do and I feel much more in my comfort zone. So um, so anyway, so that's a little bit, I went to, um, I actually don't have a background in business and um, I studied history at BYU. Um, growing up in a very rich, uh, culturally and historically rich place, I grew up in Libya. I also lived in Somalia and, um, uh, and Malta um, before moving to the United States. And um, so we were just going to Roman ruins was just, you know, very common, not a big deal. Um, learning about the Second World War, visiting um, uh, battlefields, learning about the North African campaign of, North, of, um, of World War II. It was just, I mean, it was just, opposite the road. I mean, we could just go play in the German pillboxes if we wanted to, you know, and um, sadly you would hear of people um, coming across landmines out in the desert and um, blowing up and which was always a real tragic thing to, to hear about. Um, it was, so for me, I, I grew up in a very multicultural um, environment and so and when I moved to the United States, actually um, to Eastern Utah, uh, we, um, I moved with my family and my father had purchased a ranch um, that just ran alongside the Ute Indian Reservation out in the Uinta Basin. And so for me, it was kind of a relief because I knew what to do with people of color. I mean, I, it was something that was just very much more a, a part of me. And so it, in a way that was um, a very uh, easy transition for me to um, interact with um, Native Americans than um, just your sort of straight white Americans. And um, which I kind of always found a little bit interesting. But um, anyway, I went to Brigham Young University. I got a degree in history. Um, and uh, I then spent a year and a half living in France. And um, so French has always been a real big part of my life since that time, as I have taught French um, while I was at BYU, I taught for a year and a half. Um, and then when I moved to Washington DC where I worked as a lobbyist, um, I utilized my international experience and orientation my language skills to land a job um, with a higher education association. And so for the next almost nine years, I was a lobbyist in higher education. Um, I 
Uh, I also was very active in um, advocating for West African um, immigrants and refugees. And um, so I have a lot of dear friends throughout West Africa and um, have developed a lot of um, interest and connection um, with, uh, with individuals from several West African countries. Um, and anyway, so finally I got tired of politics and I moved to Cache Valley because I have family that live here. And um, I've been the, um, the program director for global learning in the Huntsman School since uh, 2007. That's when we ran our first program. And um, we've just been going strong, except for this year. Uh, we have no programs running this year, unfortunately. Unfortunately. I know. Um, but uh, we've been able to take students all over the world. Um, it, one of the great things that I love about my job is being able to send students all over the world to have experiences that they wouldn't have until they were a seasoned professional and being able to get them out and about while they are, um, while they are a student is something that is just huge. And as you know, Hodger, that may, it, it just, it's life changing when you have that experience as a student. Um, the, uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the SEED program. Uh, that's a program that was um, developed out of my office. And um, we started creating the SEED program in 2007. And by fall of 2008, we knew that we had something that was really huge. And so we spun it off into the Center for Entrepreneurship where it could get the right kind of um, resources, mentorship, um, donations, uh, get it, you know, um, uh, get it into um, the, uh, get it woven into the, the body of the center. And as you know, the SEED program is something, our small edu um, enterprise education and development program is one of the crown jewels of the Huntsman School. Um, also, since being at the Huntsman School, I was, um, I was involved with the creation of the Huntsman Scholar Program and um, developed their initial um, global programs. Um, and uh, we launched our first pilot uh, program that became the Huntsman Scholars in fall of 2007. So it's been a real joy for me to be really involved with the global vision um, of the Huntsman School. And it's something that I really believe in. And because, and I know that because when I went to Washington DC, I started interviewing for jobs and I got my job as a brand new college grad because of my international experience, not because I was more experienced than the people I was competing with. And my director told me that. He said, um, I hired you because you, you've been around and you are, sensitized to this stuff. And um, so can you learn this, this, and this? And I said, yes, absolutely. How hard can it be? I can, I can do that. And um, so I was hired over people who actually had more qualifications, but they did not have the international experience that I had or that orientation or that way of thinking. And I really liked what Shaba said, you know, hello, citizens of the world. I think that that's something that's so important for all of us to know is that we don't occupy this planet, just one country, one person. There are all kinds of us that occupy this planet. And it's really critical that we learn to cross borders um, and to appreciate and to appreciate everybody. I love that you are able to adapt faster anywhere you go. That's a great skill though. And I adore that the Global Learning Experience Program because I had the chance to go to Peru and to London, and I can't tell you how amazing it was as a learning experience, but I will never regret. And you were accepted in your first job because you had real life experience and abroad, not just here in the United States. And I think really that's something that 
send you out, right? Yeah. And the first question is, like, Miss Shams moved to the U.S. and adapted to a new culture as a young adult. You, in the other hand, had experienced living in different cultures at a young ages or age. How does your experience adapting to new cultures compares to her? Well, um, I wasn't as sophisticated as when I encountered um, coming to the United States. Um, and um, I missed a lot of, of clues that I think as an adult I would have picked up on. Um, and um, I made a lot of assumptions that um, uh, were every once in a while really embarrassing. Sometimes it was just my friends would just look at me like I was an alien, you know. Um, but I think the bottom line, what I came to learn is that it is really important to be really open-minded. And you cannot run around and think, well, you, you need to be true to yourself. That's one thing that I have really learned. It is absolutely fine for me to be true to myself. Um, and that I never have to apologize for who I am. And if I'm in another place that does something differently than the way I do it, I do not need to feel afraid of the way that I do something or that I do something differently or that I believe differently. But what I do need to do is I need to really seek to understand. I need to value and appreciate others for what they believe in and for who they are. That's really, really key. And sometimes when you're a young person coming up with just a, a multiplicity of cultures, sometimes, I mean, you have to grow into that, right? Um, because you don't always, you get a bit frustrated. You know, well, how come they're so different? How come they didn't know what I was talking about? Um, I mean, when I was young, I, I was very well versed in international news. It was something that we did every week. Um, I went with my father into town. We got the International Herald Tribune and I read it with my father. Um, I read news magazines. I mean, I remember being eight um, and having a discussion about with my father about um, things that were happening in different, you know, different countries in the world and, and things like that. And when I moved here to uh, Eastern Utah, um, and I would try to talk about stuff like this, people would be very, I mean, they would just look at me like I was weird. They, they had uh, nothing to say to me. Um, and I would get really frustrated. And so there were times when I was younger um, that I was a bit judgmental because I would get so frustrated. Um, and I don't think that I would have done that as an adult. Um, I mean, by the time I went to university, I mean, that, that had passed and I, cause I had figured out that, oh, you know, it's okay to be, to be different or whatever. Um, I was used to differences within a multicultural society, not within an American culture where most everybody was sort of the same. Um, so that was, um, so I think that that's um, probably a bit of difference is that I didn't bring any sophistication and experience to my transition into a new culture that if I had been um, an adult, that I would have been able to think more clearly about what was going on and be able to define things a little bit more. So Initially, there was more emotion involved than being, you know, realizing, okay, this is what's going on and this is how I can work through it, et cetera, et cetera. I love that. And I love that mental thinking you had, being open-minded and seeking to understand are good, great tools to adapt to new cultures. And most importantly, that you learned how to embrace your differences and live with that and with the global learning experiences what women leaders leaders do students get to interact with 
and learn from? Well, you know, it always depends on the program and the location. Um, in some programs, we're able to connect with, um, with a number of women leaders. Um, and, but there are some times when that's just not the reality in, in the country that we're visiting. So it, it really depends. Um, typically, we, we, in most programs, I would say we always have, um, we always meet with, with some women in business or in, um, in international organizations. And, um, but it's not something that we specifically set out to do. We're looking more at companies and within, um, with companies and international organizations that we would like to tap into. We also look at our own, um, our own networks. And there is a reality that in the business, um, in, in a lot of our business networks currently, we do not have as many women in those networks as we would like. So, um, so I'm always really excited when we have individuals, um, when we have women, especially like one year, for example, um, one year when we um, were in Switzerland with Huntsman Scholar Program, uh, a colleague of mine came from Paris and she was in the middle of a merger and she came and spent the day and did a workshop with the scholars. And um, so she was the head of marketing in, um, in, a, in like the number two investment bank um, uh, in the world. And um, so she came and did a, a, a workshop with our students and she walked them through the merger. And she divided them up in teams and she gave them a task. This is your problem, solve it. So then they had to break in, break into their groups and they had to hash through the, 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 the problem. And then they had to come back and then they presented their solution. She then critiqued it. And then she told them what really happened. I mean, it was absolutely stellar. Um, and the students just had that really in-depth, nitty-gritty, you know, um, experience with something that was real world. And um, so this is the kind of thing, regardless of whether the, the business leader is a man or a woman, that's the kind of thing that you're going to get, not always in a workshop, but they are going to sit down with you and they are going to to walk you through realities in their industry and in their company. And this is where our women students, regardless of who the business leader is, can really take advantage because it is a moment as a student to realize yourself as a business professional in this industry perhaps in this com company, interacting with an individual like the business leader. How would you view? How do you feel? Do you understand what's going on? What kind of question do you ask? Um, what, one time we were in London and we had this scintillating um, conversation. I mean, it was just question and answers. It was really incredible. And afterwards, and it was with a, a major private equity, a global private equity firm. Um, and uh, at the end, um, the, the partner who, who spent time with us, he said to me, wow, your students are really on the ball. He was so impressed with them. And afterwards, student, as we were walking out and heading down the street um, for the evening, students just came up to me and said, Liz, I understand, understood everything that he said. And, um, and it was just this moment of empowerment. And so that's the thing that, that comes really through the global learning experience is these moments of empowerment and realizing what, um, what you are capable of as a woman, as a woman in business, what you can do and what you can become. 
because you shouldn't look at this as, you know, strictly in gender. You should just look at it as opportunity and um, and then what you as an individual bring to that opportunity. I, I remember when we went to Peru in Lima, we had the chance to interact with two amazing female entrepreneurs. And I really like how our school is taking the initiative to include women in the business work. And uh, I believe that that one of the solutions is to have women leaders need to lift each other. And with going to the next question, in the different places you have lived, or let's say, yeah, you have lived, you've seen women contribute. How do you see, how have you seen women contribute business in society? Well, it's been interesting because over the years that has really changed, you know. Um, when I was growing up, my dentist was a woman. Um, and of course, some of my, and which was unusual at the time, especially in Libya, um, but my dentist was a woman. Um, you know, it's very typical to, as, as you know, growing up that your, your teachers are, are women until maybe you get into junior high or high school. Um, but, uh, I've seen women a lot in small businesses. So very entrepreneurial roles. That's one thing that I've really, really noticed. I know since coming, um, when I was in Washington, DC, I noticed a lot of women in the role of being a lobbyist, being very effective. Um, a really dear friend of mine um, has, had, has played a major role in food safety and security, global food safety and security issues. Um, she has been instrumental in um, shepherding through, if you will, as a lobbyist, um, important um, food policies on, on, at the international level um, in the United States that has been enacted into, into law. So in DC, I saw a lot of women in various roles. When I was in DC, it was, it was the political arena um, so I didn't see as many, um, so I didn't interact very much with the business industry um, at, at, at that time. But women were very much a part of the political scene within higher education associations, um, non, other nonprofits, um, humanitarian, charitable nonprofits. Um, it was really interesting because um, one time, uh, Queen Noor of Jordan, um, she came and she was very involved with um, uh, Save the Children. And we had a big event with that and um, saw the things that she could do. And as she talked about her experiences and she, as, as a woman, there was just a, a, a special influence that she had within um, this, this certain international organization arena and she used it to the fullest. And yeah, I mean, she was a queen, right? But of a country, but, um, but nevertheless, she utilized that. So see, that's the thing is like, what do you have? Do you, can you utilize it? And you see that a lot. Um, a very dear friend of mine is very involved in, um, she's in India at the moment. She's from Cameroon. Um, but I have watched her um, fight for women and to develop women, um, uh, women uh, entrepreneurs uh, throughout Africa in um, various, uh, various countries. Um, she's upset some of the political powers that be, you know, there was a time she was put into prison because they just... Uh, she was just too much for them. Um, but it has been amazing. But she has this incredible vision. And she has determined that in Africa, within the various countries that where she has worked, that it is women entrepreneurs at the grassroots level that she wants to empower and develop. And so she has used everything she has. Every, every 
bit of money that she uh, earns, she puts it straight back in, you know, um, to what she is doing. And she is just absolutely passionate about what she does. And she just makes a huge, huge difference. And some of the things that she has done in helping women develop um, some of their small businesses has been really, really um, uh, inspiring to me. I really like how you included the example of that woman helping other women and lifting them up. And you have been a lobbyist for higher education, specializing in agricultural research and international agricultural development. How can we use our higher education and degrees in business fields to contribute to development in international countries? Well, one of the first things I learned when I went to DC, I was a history major. And so as um, a humanities major, of course, you know, back in the day, um, probably still in the day, um, you would, you know, types like me, we would look at business types and go, oh my gosh, those are the evil people of the world. Well, um, I mean, you know, it's very stereotypical, right? Um, people are just out to make money. Well, I went to DC and a friend and I who had majored in English and she was working in the Senate. Um, and we just, a few months into it, we just kind of looked at each other and said, you know, if we knew then what we knew now, we would have at minimum minored in business because I mean, I had to do a crash course in economics. And so fortunately the president of my association was an ag economist. He gave me things to read. I had already been an avid reader of the Wall Street Journal and, um, and you know, talked with stockbrokers and learned about Wall Street and, and trading and all of that kind of stuff. So I had a lot of people. Um, to do that. But um, so what I want to say about our education is that number one, it is really important to get a good education. The first and most important thing that you should do is complete your education and graduate. It gives you a lot of flexibility. One of the things that I have known no, that I learned while I was um, uh, a lobbyist in international agricultural development is the is the unique role that women can play in working with other women in developing countries. Women have they have the best they have the most direct access to women in developing culture in in in, in developing countries. Uh, many of those cultures are still quite conservative. Women are not a part of the mainstream. And so women can go and access the women of, of an area, a village, much more easily than any man can in who's working in development. The other thing that I learned, as I mentioned, is that business is really the thing um, well, there, there are like three things that I think are really important in development. One is education. There, individuals must have access to education. Number two, um, good health care and sanitary living conditions. That's really, really important. And the third thing that is critical that really makes these the other two things possible is economic sustainability. And that comes through business um, opportunities, um, having your own business, being economically self-reliant. And so what you're learning in business, as I have come to learn over the years, you are developing a skill set and a knowledge set that is something that is some of the most important knowledge that you can impart to other women in developing countries. If other women in developing countries can, can sustain themselves economically, they can make these other things happen. So business is absolutely critical. One of the things that is really important to know too about development 
um, work or um, development efforts is that one of the one of the worst things that you can do is okay. Let me say that this way. Obviously, you want to help people, and that's a good thing. But you don't want to go in and just do for them. So really, you can't wear your heart on your sleeve, and you can't go in and want to do just humanitarian efforts. Humanitarian efforts are really, they are important at the time of a disaster or helping bridge a gap. But humanitarian efforts in and of themselves do not, are not sustainable because they require people from the outside. But you as a business student can go in, you can teach business skills, you can help develop a business, you can teach um, individuals that the money um, in the money box does not belong to them, it belongs to the business. They, can, you, they, they need to pay themselves a salary. When their child comes and needs something, they don't go to the business cash box, they go to their own pocket for the cash. You teach them about how money works, how money can grow, um, how you manage your finances, how you don't eat your inventory. You know, there are so many things that you can do. When that's how we created, I mean, that's the, that's the foundation upon which we built the seed program that obviously we want, we, we have a heart, we have compassion, we want to make a contribution. Let's do that. Um, but we can't, that cannot be what we give to people. We have to give them something really solid so that they can say after a time, thank you so much. You can go now because I can make it happen. I know how to do it. And then you create a growth trajectory for the individual with whom you have been working. And really, there's so much intelligence um, among, among these individuals that you will be working with. You'll just be astounded. Um, and even if they don't have a formal education, the intelligence is just raw and it's there. Such great ideas, drive and motivation. Um, and I think that's really the way that you, can, that you can utilize your education is by sharing just this hardcore business knowledge and um, skills that you have developed and teaching that to somebody else and facilitating their ability to establish themselves within their own business or develop in a way that they can go get a job in another business. True, you remind me of a Chinese quote that saying, don't give me the fish, teach me how to get it. Exactly, exactly. And, and like, I believe that businessmen and women have the power to make the change. I agree. And going to the last question, how do we encourage women to take leadership positions? Well, first of all, I think that women need to realize that um, we, have, we have just as many skills and abilities. I think it's also really important to not compare ourselves to men. I think that, um, you know, when you're in a, um, everybody brings something different to the table. And I think that men and women absolutely bring different leadership styles to the table. Look at um, Jacinda Ahern, who is the prime minister and the recently re-elected prime minister of New Zealand, and how she has governed her country through this COVID-19 pandemic. She did not do it as a man would have done it. She did it as a woman would do it. And her style has really caught a lot of people's attention. And she's been very, um, very impactful. I also look at um, President Cockett, Noelle Cockett at our own university. Um, she approaches being president very, very differently um, than a man would. And it's not to say that it's better or it's worse, it's just, it's different. But she really embraces being a female president. And I think it's really interesting because through this pandemic, she has kept us so informed 
Um, and so women have really high, um, high communication skills. Women are particularly skilled in communication. Um, and uh, so I would say use that. I would identify what you feel really strong in. Um, see if, you know, do strengths finders tests or go to 16personalities.com and take that free personality test. It tells you a lot about yourself. You can read through it. There are a lot of things you can learn about what your strengths and, and what you're maybe not so strong in really value those and promote them. And I would say, um, be assertive. Don't, don't be afraid to, to talk. One of the things that they mention is that a lot of women in meetings, they don't talk as much as men. I say, if you have a thought or you have a question, pipe up, say something, ask the question, offer the observation. Um, <coughs> <clears throat> it doesn't matter if they agree with you or not, um, but get it out there. You'll be surprised at how many of your thoughts and ideas are really spot on and can actually change the course of, of the conversation. Like make your voice <clears throat> heard. And in fact, like, uh, in fact, female presidents, did great this year comparing to male presidents with coping with the COVID and all of this crisis going on. And we have a question from, a question from the audience yes. uh, to you, Liz. What is the best way to gain <coughs> international experience during these unprecedented times where we are not as likely to travel globally in person? <coughs> well, um... <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> oh, I'm going to take another Get water. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a cough because of traveling so much. Um, <clears throat> and that's not a lie. That really is the truth. Um, I got sick on a trip once and I've 10 years later, I still have the effect. Oh, I'm sorry. But I don't regret it. I mean, you know. <laughs> Uh, it was a fabulous experience and I loved being in that country. So um, <clears throat> anyway, um, there are some things that you can do. Like, for example, if you're interested, um, I could get you hooked up with a virtual international internship. Um, next semester, you could do um, an internship maybe in an Asian country um, or a European country. Um, and uh, you could take it for credit, you know, like three hours. That would be uh, three credit hours. You could um, get um, work with a company somewhere, uh, you know, do 10 hours a week. That would kind of be your equivalent of your of your three hour uh, credit. Um, but we can. But there's that opportunity. Um, students are having some really interesting experiences in working virtually internationally. Um, one of the things that you know, you might not think of off the top of your head and think, well, I would rather be there. Of course you would be, me too. Um, I missed out on two months in five countries this year. Um, and um, so that's so that's so valuable, but you would learn how to work cross-culturally via technology. For your generation, that's something that is really valuable. It's huge. It's absolutely huge. Um, you can learn how to um, uh, pick up on cultural cues and things. Also, there are, um, this is more on the tourist side, but if you just have a hankering to go see something, there are different tour companies around the world where you can take a virtual tour with them. Um, one of my favorites is Walks of Italy. Um, these people, I mean, there's all kinds of things that you could do, but these, but this, this particular company, um, uh, they do walks in other countries as well. So if you just wanna go spend an hour in Budapest or, or Rome or whatever, um, then uh, you can pay a nominal fee and you can take a tour with them. Um, so there are things like that that you can do. <coughs> One thing that I would really encourage you to think about is I would watch international programs. Um, the easiest thing is English speakers is, you know, you can 
uh, access all kinds of British TV, you know, maybe Irish TV. Um, um, on Netflix, you can get all kinds of French programs. Um, you can, I mean, there are all kinds of apps. There's BritBox, there's Acorn. Um, you can do, um, oh, uh, what is it? The It's not Slack, it's, um, but there is, a, oh, I'll have to forget it. I, anyway, I can't remember now what it is. There's too many S apps in my head right now that I want to say, but I would watch films. I would watch programs and I, I mean, on Netflix and Amazon, you have all kinds. You don't speak the language, no big deal. Just use the subtitles. Um, I think, I think just in the university they can join the clubs there's language clubs in their yeah. ethnic clubs in our university yeah absolutely absolutely you know um so there are lots of things that you can do like that but for your purposes as a business student i would really encourage you to think about a virtual internship and you can just email me at liz.allred at usu.edu and i'll get you hooked up with that so that you can explore all of the opportunities. I think that would be a really great way for you to get some business experience, but also to work in another culture. Put me in the list, please. I would love to have an internship, international okay. internship next semester. Okay, and great. to wrap up today, let me ask you this question to you and to Shabashams. What advice did both of you give to our fellow students, especially women? And what advice do you give to men regarding working along with women? Go ahead, Liz. Um, well, I would just say that what I have found is that you just need to appreciate one another and you need to appreciate yourself. We should never be ashamed or uncomfortable with who we are and what we bring to the table. I think that you need to think about what is your what your interest is and um, and go for it without apology. Um, be considerate, be a good listener, but never be afraid to speak up. And I would say that for men, I think that um, Men and women create a really interesting and powerful dynamic within any circumstance. Um, and I think that appreciating what the other brings to the table is absolutely critical. Valuing and appreciating a different perspective is really what can create something that's really, really powerful. And so that's what I would suggest. Appreciate who you are, speak up while being a good listener and value different perspectives, whether they come from men or women and value each other as colleagues and um, understand that you will get something out of the other person that you might not be able to pull out of yourself, that you, you need that back and forth to make something greater than yourself. Very good. Thank you. Well, on my end, I will echo everything that uh, is there said. So I'm not going to repeat the same thing as I am, as I am listening to you say that. And I'm like, no, what am I going to say next? <laughs> <laughs> um, but we we all are different people with different journeys and hence different experiences and and probably advice or word of wisdom as I call it. And I think for me, the what I would leave uh, people with like. Um, call for action maybe is get to know yourself. Um, I think people are just so busy in getting things done and wanting to achieve so many different things in life that they never take the time to really get to know themselves and create their own blueprint. Um, to be successful, you really have to know who you are, what you're about, what is it that you put on this planet to do, what are your strengths, what is your voice, your passion, just connect with your higher self and extract that. Um, I spoke to a teenager uh, three years ago, maybe or four years ago. I was um, at a, during Ramadan and it was during Tahajjud, like we spend the night at the mosque. 
And it was between probably two o'clock in the morning and the Fajr prayer. And um, we, we sat down and the girls started like crying after some words that we exchanged, namely questions that I was asking her about, you know, things that she's very passionate about doing and wanting to do what her heart is and, and just understanding, you know, just like this is, I think the most important question that any human being owe themselves to ask is what is it that I am put on this planet to do? I think if we learn this, or if we ask this question at an early age and we take our time through meditation and prayer and kind of just silencing all this madness and this noise, and we tune in that to that sound, that voice in us, and we get that response, everything else will fall in place. And we're so busy building other stuff that don't fit in our mold. And I think just taking that moment, that time, you know, like sometimes we tell college kids, hey, take a year, go travel through, you know, all over the world and get, yeah, take that moment. And I know that not everybody can afford it. When I, when I mean by this trip is not necessarily physically grabbing a bag and a ticket and go around the world, but really give yourself some time to distance yourself from the noise and find your own being and your own voice and your own calling. Because once you connect with that alone, everything life would make sense. And then you will know in, you know, you will gain more insight and clarity. And there are some things that I actually, I gained not long ago, <laughs> you know, after my forties that I'm like, darn it. I wish people have asked me these questions when I was younger. And that's why this 17 year old girl, beautiful girl that I was having a conversation in the middle of the night, she was just crying. And she told me, no one has ever asked me these questions. And I really want us to pay more attention to these young adults and learn from maybe not, I, I, would, I wouldn't call it mistake. Like John Maxwell says in his book, sometimes we win and sometimes we learn instead of fail. So there is really no failure in life. And I'm not a big believer on that either. The, there are things that work and things that work less and the things sometimes that are painful or whatever else, um, they teach us more. So I don't believe in failure and I don't believe that pain is necessarily a bad thing because they're all part of the journey of, of growth. So in this book, he says exactly that, that sometimes we learn and sometimes, uh, sometimes we win and sometimes we learn instead of failing. So if we just... Uh, start really having these kind of conversations with young adults because they are more in a, on a shaky ground. They haven't gotten there, you know, they haven't suffered enough to learn what we learn. We can really save them a lot of time and a lot of energy on things that we have learned um, the hard way, I would say. So my, my, I think my call for action would be uh, spend time with yourself, um, silence the noise, hear your heart of what, you, what is it that you're good at and what is it that you're put on this planet to do. And yeah, and, and, and be unapologetic about living life because when you reach that moment, the last moment where we all depart and you look back, the only thing that you're gonna regret is the risk you haven't taken, the change you haven't taken, is not believing in you enough. You know, you haven't believed in you enough to wanna to take a risk on you and it's too late. So just that moment, you know, you, you wish you could rewind and make those decisions that you were afraid to make. Wow, I really like all of this advice I'm hearing today. I'm so blessed and lucky to be here. And I would like to end up with this quote from Michelle Obama. She said, success is not about how much money you make. It's yeah. about the difference you make in people's lives. Absolutely. And today, just hearing you, you make an impact and difference in my life, hopefully. And uh, hopefully to all of the audience that is hearing us today. I'm gonna make Cameron talk. Okay. Thanks, Hadjur. And just thank you, Shaba and Liz, for taking time out of your day today to talk to us. I think we all learned a lot from you and inspired all of us, so thank you. And thank you, Hadjur, for putting this event together and for organizing it, um, and thank you for everyone who watched and is watching in the future um we hope that you guys learn from this as well and hope you have a good night yeah. salam thank you thanks everybody bye-bye